All right. Well, welcome everybody to our decent work and wages workshop. Um, I want to introduce our presenter. Pam Frake is, as you can probably see in the chat, um, an organizer with the Workers Action Center. And uh, she's the coordinator of their campaign, uh, Justice for Workers. And uh, many of you may remember the, the former name of that uh, campaign, the 15 and Fairness, which has been superseded because 15 just isn't fair anymore. Um, as we're gathered, um, I just want to run through a few um, norms that will make it easier for us to, uh, to communicate effectively. When you are not speaking, which for most of us is going to be most of the time, please keep your microphone muted. And if I hear a siren going by in somebody's neighborhood, I will mute you and then you'll need to unmute again if you, if you uh, want to, to engage. Um, when you do speak, if you have questions or comments at, at the spaces that Pam leaves in her presentation, um, take your time, be clear, and remember that, that sometimes there's a bandwidth issue, so speaking slowly and clearly is important. And uh, of course, the chat is another great place for responding, so you can put your questions and your comments into the chat. And um, that way they're, they're there for us to go back to as well, if, uh, if need be. Um, participate at your own level of comfort. Um, if you prefer to turn your video off, that's absolutely fine. Um, we, we enter into this wanting to respect one another. So we might find ourselves in disagreement, which is perfectly natural, but disrespect is not where we want to go. So this is not likely to be necessary, but if we have um, conflict of that sort, I will, I will step in. If, if there is something that has made you uncomfortable and that you want to, to have dealt with, please, um, please send me a private message in the chat and, uh, and we can go from there. So I'm going to um, post these points in the chat, just as a reminder. And um, I've introduced Pam already. Um, I will be looking out for latecomers because we're expecting a few more people. Um, but uh, for now, I will mute myself and uh, Pam, hand it over to you. Fantastic. Well. Thank you all so much for joining us today and uh, and for being really part of the Decent Work Movement. Andrea and I were talking about all the work we've done together in the years leading up to where we are today. So I really wanna thank you for that. And maybe what I'll do is I'll just share my screen to, I have a bit of an agenda for today. So you have a bit of a roadmap as to what I hope to do. But one thing I should let you know, I'm hopeful that we'll have a little bit, uh, some interaction, we're gonna do some, um, myth busting a little bit into the program and we're going to be doing a phone zap. So I'll share my screen so that you can see what I mean by all of this. So um, we'll put our, we'll make a good use of our time today. So this is the, the basic agenda that I wanted to, to review with all of you. Like we'll start off maybe by my talking about what are some of the top level issues that we're dealing with. And then we'll move into some minimum wage myth busting. Then um, my hope is that we'll all take a, a couple of minutes to make some phone calls to our members of parliament, because many of you will have heard that the federal government decided to cut Canada recovery benefits and over a million people are completely dependent on that income. And it, it's been a really devastating blow. So we're hopeful that we can change their minds on this. And then we'll just have a little debrief after that and uh, see what we can do together for next steps. Uh, does that sound like a decent plan for anyone I can see? Yeah, I see a few thumbs up. That's awesome. 
Well, the first point on the uh, on our action plan or our decent work agenda is probably no surprise to any of you. But the truth of the matter is, um, racism is a is an absolutely huge issue in our labor market and. One of the things that COVID has really exposed is that workers who have been on the front lines were sent into the pandemic with the least amounts of protections. And we know that women and newcomers, workers of color are all massively overrepresented in precarious and low wage jobs. So the decent work really is a racial justice issue. And, um, and actually, if we can address the systemic challenges of why decent work per, or, you know, indecent work persists, we're gonna be able to close the, not only the gender wage gap, but actually the racial wage gap. Um, and just to give you an example, for, we'll talk more about paid sick days in a minute, but um, it's the, the workers, who, workers who make less than, um, you know, less than $30,000 a year, are the most unlikely workers to have access to paid sick days. And again, because those jobs are overwhelming, you know, uh, uh, are disproportionately occupied by people of color, you can see how every facet of indecent work has a racist component to it. It, it entrenches the biases in our labor market, it entrenches inequities, it entrenches unfairness. Uh, and so these are the things that we're trying to address in law. And we'll go through those uh, a little bit more. But you can see, you know, you heard you know, earlier today from, you know, warehouse worker, the experience of uh, Amazon warehouse work and so forth. Um, these were huge sources of COVID-19 outbreaks. Farms, where farms had the, had the uh, you know, had to be shut down. Meat processing plants. These were all really huge vectors. And they're all places where, workers in, you know, racialized workers, low-income workers, newcomer workers, migrant workers are overrepresented. And we, when we don't protect everyone, then we ourselves are not protected. Like, and, and I think that's the thing, like COVID isn't going to respect the workplace. COVID, as we know, if, 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 you know, if my neighbor isn't safe and I'm safe, I can't feel smug around that because that, does, it, that is actually not gonna protect me. And I think COVID really showed that we're, we really, you know, we are in it together, but we have to make that a reality and really protect each other. So really addressing racism and, and status for all. One issue that really makes it uh, more difficult for migrant workers uh, to organize, to, to improve their working conditions and to improve their wages is that because they don't have permanent residency status in the country, it's not merely the, the you know, challenges that go along with speaking out and you know, potentially jeopardizing your job, which you know, many workers have to overcome those, those challenges anyway. But for migrant workers without status, it means that they could actually be deported out of the country and you know, their families can be put at risk and so forth. So in order for us to be able to involve everyone, we really have to fight for full immigration status for all migrants, because unless they have the same rights to, as all of us, we're, you know, they're gonna be at a huge disadvantage and we're gonna lose their participation from our movements. And it's really important that we have a place for everyone because we can't do it by ourselves. We need, you know, we really do need to unite the 99%. So um, just going back to our agenda, status for all and ending racism and discrimination in the workplace is absolutely huge. And I think there's new eyes and new ears to really see these, uh, you know, the problems of, you know, white supremacy, not in the sense of, you know, neo-Nazis, but just what, what one might call unconscious biases, like where we don't always appreciate that it's a you know, that that we're replicating power dynamics in our movements and outside our movements. So how do we interrupt those things? How do we center racism and or the, the center racialized workers and end racism and discrimination in the workplace, but in our movements as we go? And then on to the other workplace issues. The shocking thing is is that when our laws allow uh, allow their <laughs> Basically, when our law, uh, laws allow employers to hire people in at 
sub-poverty wage rates and in dangerous and unstable working conditions, of course, that's what's going to happen because that's how, generally speaking, that's how businesses make money is they try to minimize labor costs and they try to maximize, you know, profit. And, and as long as the laws allow that to take place, then we're going to have these problems in the workplace. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is really address the structural issues of precarious employment. And that really does mean focusing on changing the laws provincially and federally. And as Andrea was saying earlier, you know, when we launched the Fight for 15 and Fairness, it was April 2015. It's hard to believe that's six years ago. And in those days, $15 seemed, you know, pretty ambitious, uh, considering the minimum wage had just been bumped to $11 an hour and then adjusted for cost of living and so forth. Um, but we can see that through the experience of the last five, five or six years that, you know, prices have continued to soar. $15 is really, as Andrew was saying, not enough. But the one other thing it's worth saying is that had we, and many of you probably know, we did win a $15 minimum wage. It's just that Doug Ford, our current premier, got elected. And the first thing that Doug Ford did was to repeal all of the progressive labor laws that we had fought for together. And all of you who are part of 15 and Fairness made possible. That was one of the first things that Doug Ford did. And, and when you really think about it, and I do think we should pause for a minute, we had won a whole bunch of different things for workers. We had won a path to a $15 minimum wage plus annual cost of living adjustments. We had won a provision whereby it was not gonna be legal anymore to pay a worker less than their full-time co-worker. And that was an extraordinary thing because even in sometimes in unionized environments, you can have a part-time worker earning half the wages of their full-time counterpart and they could sit side by side and do the same job as the other. One, and, and I'll give you a real life example of library workers, the part-time worker earning $18 an hour and the full-time worker earning $32 an hour. And, and, I'm, and, and so these are the kinds of things, but the legislation that we won through Bill 148 under the previous government said that's not allowed anymore. You have to hire part-time and full-time people at the same wage rate. And that was hugely important for temp agency workers because the way that um, temp agencies make their money is that they basically uh, go, you know, provide workers to an employer and say, okay, great, you, you, got, you need 20 people and you're willing to pay 20 bucks an hour, great. We'll deliver you those 20 people, but we'll pay them the minimum wage and then we'll pocket the difference. And that's how temp agencies make their money. And even, and, and one of the reasons why corporate, you know, why their clients, the clients of the temp agencies actually use temp agencies is that because the temp agency is technically the employer, it means the client company is not responsible for the health and safety of those workers. They're not responsible, like if a worker gets injured, they're not responsible for back to work plans, et cetera, et cetera. They're very disposable. And the other thing is, is that the way the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act operates, it's like insurance premiums. So when you have a workplace you know, injury or death, your premiums go up. It's supposed to create incentives for employers to improve their health and safety. But in fact, it creates, dis it, 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 it creates pressure on employers to try and hide their workplace injuries and deaths rates. And many of you will recall that the fact that there's been five deaths at, uh, to have temp agency workers who were basically working either directly or indirectly for Fiera Foods. And this is because it is legal to pay workers differential prices and the client company is not responsible for this health and well-being of the workers. And this has to change. And the really sickening thing is that the last government brought in a law that would change that. It, would, it was an amendment to the Worker Safety and Insurance Act, uh, section 83.4, that would have made the client company and the temp agency jointly responsible for the well-being of workers. And that was crucially important. And that legislation is actually on the books and ready to go. It's just that the, the previous government didn't enact it before the election was called. 
And so as a consequence, Doug Ford has been sitting on this perfectly good legislation that will save lives, but he has not enacted it, even though, uh, the, you know, basically uh, you know, two temp agency workers have died while he's been premier of the province. So that's something we really want to push for. So equal pay so that, you know, that the profit for the temp agency worker has to come from the client company, not from the pockets of the workers themselves. And then, and then if you make them jointly responsible, all of a sudden what you do is you've eliminated the incentives for employers to create bad jobs. And so, and in fact, for the brief moment in time where equal pay for uh, directly hired and temp agency workers existed under our old legislation, all sorts of you know, warehouse uh, employers and so forth basically said, that, well, we're not gonna bother going to a temp agency anymore. We're just gonna hire those workers directly. And in some cases where those plants were unionized, they had the protection of a union for the first time. So it really does, you can see how just these small structural things have huge impacts around the quality of work that people can access. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, I'll move on quickly to talk a little bit about um, you know, um, paid sick days. I'm sure it needs no explanation now that we've all been through a pandemic, but evidence from the US shows that where paid sick days, like an adequate number of paid sick days have been in place. So whether that's eight, nine or 10 days in American jurisdictions, even on the basis of flu, there's evidence that shows that there's a 40% reduction in transmission. Imagine if we had had paid sick days before COVID broke out. It's just, it's just heartbreaking because so many workers, when you talk to workers who got COVID at work, um, oh, it's just heartbreaking who basically said, you know, I did feel sick, but I can't afford to lose a day's pay. I can't af afford to lose a dollar. And I, you know, you go to work and you just hope for the best. You hope that it's not COVID because you simply can't afford to lose pay. So it's, it's just bonkers to me that we are this far along in a pandemic. And as yet, no jurisdiction in Canada has implemented a minimum of 10 permanent employer paid sick days. What I will say is thanks to all of you and the work that we've done together in Ontario and across the country, it is now definitely on the legislative agenda. So we have the federal government has promised to legislate 10 uh, paid sick days for all federally regulated workers. Right now, there's a giant debate in British Columbia about how many permanent paid sick days they're going to deliver. The, the, you know, the big business lobbyists are, are out there creating hysteria saying, providing paid sick days is going to bankrupt small businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just, it's, it's just rubbish. If you look at every other jurisdiction, including the um, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, it is standard for workers to have uh, access to paid sick days for short term, um, you know, personal emergencies. Um, so all of that is rubbish, but you can see how this is playing out. And then last point I'll just end on, uh, just in terms of our key issues, there's a huge problem around misclassifying workers as independent contractors and self-employed instead of as workers. So it's, it's absolutely rampant. You get cleaners who are basically working for less than minimum wage because they, they basically bid out the contracts and the lowest bidder gets the contracts. But because none of the workers are protected by the Employment Standards Act, it's really possible for people to be working for less than minimum wage. And then they don't get any of their other entitlements. They don't get Canada Pension Plan. They don't get employment insurance. They don't get severance. They don't have any of those basic protections. So, and, and, and you're gonna be hearing a lot about gig workers and how we need to protect gig workers. Well, the way to protect gig workers is to, make, is to end misclassification and give them full and equal rights with every other worker under the Employment Standards Act. What is happening now is governments are trying to create a new category of workers called gig workers, where they will not have the same benefits that as, as workers, that they will still be treated as independent contractors and self-employed. And they're going to pretend that these are protections when in fact, it's basically entrenching, um, you know, second class status in terms of workers. So um, we'll talk more about this later on, but, but ending misclassification and really um, improving the laws to protect temp agency workers so you can't hire temp agency workers forever just because you can get away with it. 
So that those are the top issues. And I'm going to move to one more slide. I want to show you the impact of uh, the the decision of Doug Ford and the and his um, uh, party to cut the minimum wage. So had he just left the minimum wage alone, you will recall that it was supposed to go up to uh, uh, well, it did go up to fourteen dollars in 2018, and then it was supposed to be fifteen dollars in 2019. Um, and then it would have been adjusted in October 2019, it would have been adjusted in October 2020, and it would have been adjusted again in October 21. And had the Doug Ford not cancelled it, our minimum wage today would be 1575. Now that still wouldn't cut it, but you can see the impact. It's basically a, almost $2.5 million an hour for every hour that you know, minimum wage workers work together. So it's a staggering amount of money that has been transferred directly from workers' pockets back into corporate profits. And we'll talk a little bit later about who are the biggest employers of minimum wage earners. And uh, spoiler alert, it's not small businesses. So just wanted to, you know, that and, and really what, what we're saying around the $20 minimum wage, our demand for 20, is to say it should be our minimum wage should be immediately restored and we're going to make that a huge issue in the next election it should immediately be restored to $16 and then bumped to $20 as quickly as possible because it's it's just not possible to survive on the minimum wage and uh, and we really need action on this so anything less than $16 at this point is is yeah is not going to cut it and what what we need is $20 as fast as possible so why don't I pause and see if anybody has any questions before we go on to the next section of the agenda. And you might have to shout out because I can't actually see when hands are up. I, I'll be looking for hands and you can also, I'll remind you, you can also put um, questions and comments in the chat to share with everyone. That would be great. Okay, well, hearing none, um, next, then maybe what we'll do is we'll move to our little next, uh, our little let's test our knowledge. Um, and let me move the slide. Okay, come on. Come on, this is suddenly not cooperating here. Ah, there we go. Boom. Okay, so. How, so on January 1st, 2018, the Ontario minimum wage increased from $11.65 an hour to $14 an hour. Corporations, you know, big business lobbyists, the Chamber of Commerce, the Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses predicted 185,000 jobs would be lost. They said it would be catastrophic to the economy um, if this was a, allowed to go ahead. So here's our skill testing question. What really happened uh, when the minimum wage in, in, the, in the year following that first minimum wage bump? 185,000 jobs were actually lost, question mark? Or were 50,000 jobs lost? Or were 130,000 new jobs created? What do people think? You could actually put it in the chat if you wanted to. Any guesses? Okay, well, spoiler alert. Uh, in fact, oops, come on, mouse. In fact, 130,000 new jobs were created. And so I think we just really, you know, in, this, in the spirit of remembering and remaking, let's remember all the lies that the big business lobbyists were telling us. And then, and, and let's keep that in mind for the next round when we come to paid sick days. And then I'll just quickly blow through, you know, some of the evidence. Yeah, awesome. I see all of you guessing. See, awesome. Um, just to just to give you an example, like you know, we're not making this up. Really, the Financial Accountability Office basically said all the employment gains in 2018 were driven almost entirely by an increase in full-time jobs, and that's just so important because everybody, the the big business lobbies, kept saying the workers are going to lose hours. This is going to be disaster, etc. So on that note, um, we'll go to our next skills testing question. Um, and that is that when Doug Ford ran for office, he said workers would be much better off 
um, if he reduced taxes for low income workers, rather than raising the minimum wage to 15. And so the question for all of us is, after reducing taxes and canceling the $15 minimum wage, what happened? Did workers have the same amount of money in their pockets? Did workers have less money in their pockets? Did workers have more money in their pockets? Yes, exactly. I see Don has guessed B. Is there any disagreement on that? Exactly. And it's just shocking how people get away with not being honest with people. But just to give you the background, again, the Financial Accountability Office estimates that about 1.3 million people would have received a total net after-tax benefit of $1.1 billion from increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour from 14. So that's, so not, oh, it's just so awful. So you can just see how this whole path of this government has been to transfer money away from workers and back into corporations. Um, and, you know, and again, there, this is the evidence in case people don't believe us, but the Financial Accountability Office did a really good job of showing what, um, what should have, what could have happened um, had the $15 minimum wage gone ahead. Um, and then same thing, just to, just to give people a bit of a sense, this is the, this is the evidence there. So um, we should feel very confident when we advocate for higher wages for workers that it's not gonna break the economy. Um, next skills testing question. Um, uh, when the minimum wage was increased uh, to, 15, uh, to $14 a year, what happened to workers' wages? Did, uh, did workers' wages go down? Um, did they, you know, was there less employment? You know, what all happened there? So what do people think? Uh, option A, uh, average hourly wages for all workers increased by 3.5%, um, uh, which would have been the largest increase since 2008. Um, did accommodation and food service workers' wages increase? Did part-time workers' wages increase? Did young workers' wages increase? And in fact, what are people guessing? All of the above happened. It's just astonishing. So just to, again, just to unpack it, the, the, in fact, the credit for the wage increases that took place were actually given by the Financial Accountability Office to the increases in the minimum wage. So for all the bluster you'll hear from big business lobbyists to say minimum wage earners don't deserve a higher wage because they're already in low income house or high income house or sorry in households where the household income is above the poverty line. So therefore, we don't need to worry about uh, minimum wage earners. And it's a blunt uh, it's a blunt instrument is another favorite expression that doesn't target who needs it to, to be targeted. Um, that's all just rubbish. And we saw it would have, you know, had the minimum wage, uh, you know, gone to 15, there would have been even more benefits for people. Um, so uh, again, did it cause inflation? Because that's another common notion that, boy, if we increase the minimum wage, all the businesses are going to have to increase their prices to accommodate it. And it turns out that inflation after the minimum wage was increased was actually lower. So it's just none of these things that the big business lobbyists tell us are actually true. Um, yes, and thank you, Andrea, it's very true. And actually it's justice for workers. I'll, um, I'll put the link in the chat. So it, yeah, justice with the number four, uh, justice number four workers.org. Um, so yeah, so moving on, um, here's another question. What do you think about small business owners? Do you think small business owners support raising the minimum wage, oppose raising the minimum wage, or don't feel strongly either way? Because that's one thing you hear a lot about. The Canadian Federation of Independent Businesses claims to speak for small businesses, and they are always out there opposing the minimum wage. But in fact, the public opinion polls um, of the small business owners shows that in, in both in Canada and the United States, uh, small businesses support raising the minimum wage. And one of the reasons for this is that 
small business owners can't have staff walking out the door every time there's a better job comes along. So they have to invest in their wages. They have to invest in the you know training. They have, and so they have to pay wages that are going to be decent. And so what they would like is to not have to compete with the WalMarts of the world that pay terrible wages, that don't provide paid sick days and so forth. What they would like is legislation to level the playing field so that every big corporation has to, you know, can, you know makes, makes its money not off the backs of workers, but, but through um, more effective business practices. So, um, and that is really shocking for people when, when, the, when they hear this, but I'll just give you, you know, 67, back in 2017, around the $15 minimum wage, 67 supported raising the minimum minimum wage to 15 and a substantial proportion, oh, I have a typo there, a substantial proportion of those felt that $15 was too low. And that was way back in 2017. Same thing in the US, 80% of small business owners supported in the United States raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And in fact, it was a bit of a scandal because somebody leaked the um, Chamber of Commerce survey results to the press because the Chambers of Commerce almost universally across the US opposed and actively organized against raising the minimum wage to 15. And so when these um, results were leaked, it was a bit of a scandal at the time. So again, one of the reasons that this happens is a lot of the funding for these small business um, lobby groups are, comes from big businesses. And so they use small businesses to, as a fig leaf for a, a big business agenda. And the good news is that there are actually uh, more small business owners that are speaking out all the time. I'll just flip quickly. Whoops, so I, um, there's more small business owners um, speaking out all the time. And in fact, there's a new organization called Better Way Alliance. And it's a small business, small and medium-sized business owners who actually use decent work as a foundation of their business model. And they've been very successful. And in fact, the things that they are talking about that they need help with, they need help with commercial rent control. They need the you know, supports for small businesses that are actually trying to do business a different way. And what would help them is leveling the playing field. And just a little reminder, is that it really that this, this the evidence shows that it's large firms with more than 500 employees who employ the greatest proportion of minimum wage employees. So that is just a, a, something we always have to keep in mind is that it's not small, small businesses are not the problem. Small businesses by and large are actually, you know, progressive and trying to do the right thing. It's the big corporations, it's the Walmarts, the Amazons, the Loblaws, all these grocery store empires that refuse to pay a decent wage, even though literally they have made out like bandits. And that's the, the, the slide I wanna just let you sit with. This was um, some data that Oxfam compiled six months into the pandemic. So these are already a year, uh, they're a year old, but this is how much money has been made by big corporations. So you can, so we can all appreciate why they're opposed to raising the minimum wage because they're not gonna get this kind of returns that is the one thing that when you raise the minimum wage, it does reduce the, the overwhelming profit margins that these uh, fast food and grocery store chains and so forth. So, but you know what? We think it's okay to not have so many trillionaires and billionaires and all of that. We think it's more important that humans are prioritized in this. So that tells us that we can, you know, it's very possible to do it. And yes, we can afford it. And it's actually one of the reasons we can afford it because Everybody thinks that business owners right now are just paying the most they possibly can to workers. And if the wages go up, then how are they ever gonna make it? But the truth of the matter is most of the big fat profitable corporations are paying the least they possibly can to workers. And that's why it doesn't trigger price increases when wages go up. And it's also why um, it doesn't wreck the economy because we know that um, you know, businesses could pay a lot more. The one thing I will say about price increases, and we're experiencing it this year, is that usually inflation is caused by so many other challenges. Climate change is a huge contributor to inflation. 
the, the bottlenecks caused by COVID are causing inflation. Scarcity is causing inflation. Those are the things that cause inflation. Even currency fluctuations cause inflation, but it's not workers' wages. Generally what happens is that inflation begins and then workers strive to try to keep their wages up. And that's, I think, what we're seeing this year where finally workers are saying enough is enough is enough. We can't continue in these jobs. We can't survive in these jobs anymore. It's, it's simply not possible and more and more workers are speaking out. So do we need to take a little pause to see if people have questions or comments? And if not, this is where I hope to get you talking, maybe not on screen, but this is the part where I'm hopeful that you'll all take a minute to make some phone calls. Because in addition to restructuring the laws provincially and federally to you know, create better working conditions for workers. We really have to have meaningful income supports for people. And all of you, I'm sure, are aware of how crucial it was that the federal government acted when it did to bring in the first the Canada Emergency Response Benefits and then the Canada Recovery Benefits. And, you know, at first it was just going to be, a, you know, I think their first uh, proposal was 300 and we had to fight and we got it up to $500. So, you know, fight, 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 fight to make sure that workers had what they needed. But I think we really learned in that process that we all need at least $500 a week to survive, either through wages, through income supports, or through, you know, um, you know uh, old age security and guaranteed income supplements. We need it for social assistance and uh, for uh, Ontario Dis Disability Supports Program. All of us need at least $500 a week to survive. Now, what the federal government did last summer is cut it when, uh, you know, when, when COVID started getting a little bit under control, they cut it back down to $300 a week. And for EI, they made these kind of parallel changes for the recovery benefits and employment insurance. And so you could the least, so for, for a while, there was a minimum for EI and a minimum for CRB of $500 a week. Um, they cut it down to $300 a week for CRB last summer, and the $300 a week the minimum for EI is expiring on November 20th. But the government has some leeway to be able to fix this. And so what we're saying is that, first of all, please do not cut people off in reco recovery benefits. It's, it's just been disastrous for workers. Over a million workers have been affected, and there was basically no notice because they basically, it was set to expire on the 23rd and they announced on two days beforehand that it would be expiring. Even though every other deadline that's come up through COVID, the federal government has gone ahead and extended it. So people could be forgiven, especially as we talked about at the beginning, COVID was peaking, Alberta was on fire, you know, like we were having the Delta variant, we've got school closures, like we can't, and the economy isn't even fully open. So it's just bonkers to think that all those jobs are still there. And then this notion that somehow people are sitting around on CRB and that's what's causing the labor shortage. That is the most offensive thing I have ever heard in my entire life. If that were true, back when CRB first started, there wouldn't have been a single frontline worker on the job because people went to work cleaning, people went to work in the grocery stores, People went to work on the farms, the delivery workers, every single person who kept us going during COVID were by and large people who made less than $500 a week. And if we, if we were just a bunch of schleps uh, sitting around taking advantage of CRB, then there would have been not one single thing moved. But those workers that are, are, are on CRB are, are people who are also delivery workers, who are also trying to supplement reductions in hours, reductions in customers, all of those kinds of things. And so it is disastrous that the government has moved in this way. And I think they're drinking the Kool-Aid from the big business lobby that is basically saying the way we're gonna address the so-called labor shortage, we're gonna drive workers, we're gonna starve them into desperation to get them to take the worst jobs so that employers can still be putting people on the moon instead of paying their workers properly. So that's what is happening. We need to change the minds of the government. Um, there is also a, a, another dynamic that's happening. A lot of people who, for, let's take the restaurant sector, for example, a lot of folks who were, you know, they might've been terrible wages and people might know the liquor server wages are actually less than the adult minimum wage. So 
the wage levels for for restaurant and and liquor servers are are less than even the adult minimum wage and so what a lot of workers were finding is like they're going into these incredibly dangerous situations customers not wearing masks not knowing what they're into lousy wages reduced capacity tips of course everyone's income disappeared during covid so tips aren't even there to offset it so a lot of workers basically said i can't do this anymore and they have retrained and got other jobs and the evidence shows that most of the workers where there's bottlenecks are actually working they're just not going back to those crummy jobs and so the people who are still reliant on serve are people who are trying to uh, make sure that the, the job they get and their skill set match because that's also economically efficient. We don't want people wasting their skills just because the economy hasn't bound, bounced back. So that's the real, and then there's the, just basic bottlenecks where, you know, things open up, everyone, you know, it, it just hasn't kind of shaken down yet in terms of uh, what the labor market is doing. So those, those are the reasons for a labor shortage. It's not because of CRB and we've got to get it back. So my hope is that we can take five minutes or so to make three phone calls. We want to call the prime minister, we, uh, Justin Trudeau. We want to call Christia Freeland, who's the finance minister. And we want us, everyone to call their own member of parliament. And maybe I'll see if Andrea can just paste the find your own member of parliament link in the chat. Because if you don't know their contact details, you can just put type your postal code into the search and your MP will come up and then you'll have the phone numbers that are handy right there. So is that cool for folks if we take a minute to do that? I know I don't I know people's cameras are off so I hope it's okay. I'll I'll make a few phone calls myself. They've heard from me a few times. So uh, but what we've done is we've given you the phone numbers for the prime minister on screen and the phone number for Christia Freeland. Um, and then uh, uh, some suggested talking points. You don't have to, you, you can read this directly while you're making your call, or you can make it up, you know, speak passionately from your own perspective. And if you know somebody who's been affected directly, that's really great to share to really humanize uh, the experience. So if it's cool with you. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm just experiencing a little trouble pasting the copying and pasting the link. Ah, okay. Um, well, you know what, here, how about if I, I think I might be able to actually type it in. Um, let's see. Does that, can people access that? Um, if you click on, so I just pasted it in the that, chat. That should, yeah, that should be good. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'm not sure, I haven't phoned the prime minister on a weekend, but you may get a real person when you speak, but it's, I think it's because they hire staff to answer the phone with a real person um, uh, for the prime minister's office. So they're really nice. Usually they're super nice and very sympathetic. So you can tell them uh, your message um, or they might just put you through to the prime minister's voicemail. The other, and then for Christia Freeland, that the, the number on screen is her riding office. One of the things that we've learned is that the, uh, the federal government is phasing out phone numbers for people's, like the finance minister's phone number because they don't want people phoning. So we're just gonna have to phone their constituency office, even though the message might say, this is the constituency office. If you want to talk to them in, in their capacity as finance minister, you need to call blah, blah, blah. But that never gets to the minister. That only gets to senior staff. So we want to make sure that the, that the actual uh, minister hears. So we're going to ignore the voicemail message and we're going to leave our own message there. And then same thing. When you call your own MP, you can talk about anything you like and you can remind them that you vote in the riding and that that's an important point. So do people feel like we're ready to go? We have enough information for this. Okay, well, I'm gonna even mute myself or I'm gonna try to mute myself. And there we go. And I'm gonna make my phone calls too. And my favorite to ask of you is that, um, let me know, let, like just 
type in the chat so we can see like if you make it leave a message for the prime minister or leave a message for Christia Freeland or if you get through to your own member of parliament and then we'll just have a bit of a sense of how much time we need and as soon as you've had a chance to make your three calls you can just say done and then we'll know to pick it up again sound like a plan okay i'm muting
Hello, Pam. Can you hear me? I can now. Okay, just to say I I have not got any control over the Zoom screen. Oh, okay. Um, so, <laughs> um, I, I am, in fact, having to hold down the space bar to talk. Um, but um, that seems to be like a, a workaround for communication. So if everyone else is still good, please carry. Great. Okay, well, it looks like if everyone's finished, I think um, we can move on with the next uh, with the next slide. So just maybe people could let us know in the chat, how did you find it? I'm, I see there's still one, looks like there's a couple of people still on the phone. I'm, I, I don't wanna move the script in case folks are still reliant on it. So when, everyone, when everyone's done, just maybe we'll give it one more minute. Okay, perfect. And then even if uh, you don't get your own MP called, you can always call after the conference. So we don't feel like we have to do it right this second. But the fact that you're making these calls makes such a huge, huge, huge difference. So, so is that okay if we, if we move on to the next, to the next slide? I see a few nodding heads. Okay, excellent. Okay, so if you just wanna maybe leave in the chat, uh, how it went, and and also like, did you find this the suggested script helpful? Did you find the talking points helpful? Your feedback helps us to try to change it up. Um, uh, so that would be yes, that's great. And the question: Do you feel phone calls are more? Oh yes. So I think we need both. So emails are good, and we do have an email tool that I'll share with you um, shortly. Um, but I do think phone calls that are also really important that it just emails are very easy to delete. They're very, you know, they're very automated. And I think when humans take time to share their own feelings, it's good. And the more we can make it our own, the message our own and not super scripted, I think the more powerful it is. And actually, one of the things I was going to suggest for folks as follow ups is that maybe people might even request a meeting with either their member of parliament or with their member of provincial parliament because all the issues we talk about are all, are all live issues federally and provincially. So you could request a meeting with your MP to talk about the Canada recovery benefits and fixing EI. You could also talk to them about the urgency that they follow through on their promise to implement the 10 paid sick days and one other little three cheers, maybe uh, just to mention to all of you, even though it was a year late, thanks to all of you and all your work in the fight for 15 and fairness, we did manage to squeeze a $15 federal minimum wage out of uh, the federal government. And uh, so that $15 federal minimum wage is going to be coming into effect on December 29th. And again, that would never have happened with all of you. And even though here in Ontario it might not seem like much when we're at you know, 1435 right now, $15 federal minimum wage doesn't seem that exciting, but there are other provinces across the country where the minimum wage is shockingly low. So there's a few provinces that are, have a minimum wage of less than $12. And so a $15 minimum wage for minimum wage earners in the federally regulated sector in say New Brunswick, for example, that is gonna be a 28% wage increase. And so this is a big deal. Um, the government had originally promised that they were gonna have it in place by, by last year, but they did, you know, and we, we phoned them, we wrote to them, we emailed zapped them and so forth. So I think all of that pressure, the emails, the phoning, you know, we did poster blitzes and all of those kinds of things, they all made a really big difference and we did get that delivered. So. So you can say we won our 15 and fairness campaign twice, <laughs> provincially, federally, and then we lost it provincially, but hopefully we're going to get it back and, and get back more. So it really does show that even in difficult circumstances, uh, we can make changes. And even maybe one more thing to say that's really important is even on the paid sick days piece um, in Ontario, it's a situation where we had fought so hard uh, for paid sick days and the last government delivered two, only two paid sick days. Um, but the first thing Ford did was cut those two paid sick days. So again, sending people into COVID with even less protections than they had had. 
But what is extraordinary is how much we've been able to move the dial on paid sick days, even though we haven't got the legislation yet. But because we've been you know, doing the phone calls, doing the emails, doing the MPP visits, doing the MP visits, all of those kinds of things, we were able to make the paid sick days, 10 paid sick days, a federal election issue. And I'm so, so, so proud to say that last year, it was about this time last year where the Ontario NDP basically took a leap of faith and they amplified the, the demands that we were putting forward around paid sick days, which was the permanent paid sick days, but plus an automatic additional two weeks during a pandemic, because everyone needs a certain amount of paid sick days, you know, just for ordinary day-to-day -day things. If your kid is sick, if you're sick, if you need to get vaccinated, if your, you know, plumbing breaks, if you have uh, an older person to care for, all of those things, you know, we, we need an adequate number of paid sick days permanently and for everyone. But what we were hearing from frontline workers, and especially in the long-term care sector, personal support workers, that, um, that they were burning, even if they had, a, had paid sick days in their collective agreement, they were burning through those paid sick days because every time, like flu season, for example, if people have symptoms, they have to self-isolate by law. So all of the self-isolating, self-isolating, self-isolating that was taking place is that people were using up their vacation and, and then, you know, and, and so that's not a good situation. So we really wanted to make sure that in addition to the permanent paid sick days, we get the additional two weeks. And uh, the NDP took a chance and they tabled legislation last year. And then that built the confidence of the Liberals. And then they too tabled legislation last year. So we had two private members bills on paid sick days. And we kept fighting. And of course, Doug Ford voted against them all. In fact, the Doug Ford and the Conservative Party have voted against paid sick days 25 times in, in this session of the Legislative Assembly. It's, it's really shocking. But we did force him to bring in the temporary paid sick days. So that shows us that we can even, so he cut the two permanent paid sick days, but then he was forced to bring back three temporary paid sick days. And that has helped a lot of people get their vaccinations and so forth, but obviously it's not enough. And those temporary days are expiring in December as well. So just to say like, even in difficult circumstances, if we mobilize, if we use our voice, if we use uh, every creative, I mean, social media, all of that, if we talk to our neighbors and friends, we can really make a difference and, and really move the dial on this. So we should be feeling very proud of that. But the best news of all is that the first thing that happened when the Ontario Legislative Assembly came back is both the Liberals and the NDP both tabled legislation for 10 permanent paid sick days, plus an additional two weeks of uh, paid sick days during a pandemic. And that tells us that we've all been working very effectively because when our political leaders have the confidence to take our demands forward, that tells us that we've built a strong base of support and we should feel very proud of that. And it really does, even when things seem grim and, you know, and difficult, it means if we keep mobilizing, we make our own opportunities. And so we'll see what happens. November 18th is the vote on uh, the NDP private members bill. We don't yet know when the Liberals bill will be coming up. But we'll see if, is, if this government is going to vote against this legislation yet again. So we'll see what happens. But th what we do know for certain is that the June 2nd election is going to be very, very important. When we talk about remembering and remaking the world, we want to remember what this government did. And we want to remember all the, the, the myths that the big business lobbyists were putting forward. And when we fight to remake decent work in this province. We wanna make sure that we elect champions for human beings, champions for workers, champion, champions for the economy, for the, for the, sorry, for the, uh, for the climate and for our public services, because that is really how we help each other. But we don't wanna be electing any more big business uh, supporters because big businesses are really about putting men in the moon, um, you know, men on moons and maybe the odd woman or two on the moon but can't deliver, won't be willing to pay taxes so that we can have clean drinking water in indigenous communities across the country. Like, it's just shocking to me. So this is what we have to turn around. June 2nd is gonna be very important. So talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors. If you wanna get more involved, you can join the next organizing meeting, which is taking place on November 16th at 7 p.m. And we would love to have 
people from the faith community to be speaking of it from a faith perspective. And, uh, and faith leaders have been so important in bringing our movement this far. Um, and maybe the last thing I'll say, and how are we doing for time? We're just about out of time. Um, uh, I, if anyone has a couple of dollars that they might be able to spend, I will say that COVID, you know, we took a bit of a hit in our uh, financial base. And so if people were in a position to help us out, on a, to, by becoming a monthly or, uh, or weekly donor for five bucks a month or 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month, that would be just so, so, so helpful. It gives us kind of a steady stream of income and that allows us to plan and help us expand our infrastructure. Because one big challenge we have is we know that the, the appetite for justice, the appetite for decent work is massive. But what we need are more human capacity so that we can turn the sentiment into organization and that we can be as effective as we can be. So that's what we're trying to do between now and June 2nd. But of course, we're going to keep at it every day of the year. So maybe I'll just pause again to see if anyone has any questions. And again, just put it in the chat. Um, and I'll paste when I maybe I'll stop sharing my screen. I can paste a few links in the chat as well. But you've all, oh, good, I see a hand. Please um, go ahead, go for it. Hi, Pam, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to, it, this was great and so informative and just confirmed so much of what I've been suspecting for the past uh, two years, so thank you. Um, I just, as a former um, chair of the Archbishop's Youth Ministry Committee, um, I just wanna put a little word out um, for something you can do in your parishes, which is to ensure that your youth ministers and your children's ministers, um, probably your musicians and administrators as well, but I'm more, I know these folks, please make sure that they are receiving a fair, um, a fair living wage um, without reducing without reducing their hours. And if they aren't, um, work out a contract with them, uh, with the parish. A great time to ask about this is at your budget, you know, when you do your annual meeting at your budget, when you see that youth ministry line, that youth min or that wages line, a, a very simple question is, are all of our workers receiving at least $20 an hour? Um, and if they aren't, um, how can we make it so without reducing their hours? That's one great thing you can do in your parishes. Thank you. You know, that is so, so, so important um, to lead by example. And, you know, that's one of the things we're asking the federal government, even though the federal government regulates a smaller proportion of workers, but it's exactly that. It's like if the federal government wants to persuade the provinces to do the right thing, lead by example. And I think that's, Don, your point is so well taken, is that if we can do everything we can to lead by example, then it's gonna build the confidence of other people. And it's not as daunting as one might think. Um, and the other thing we can also do is be talking about making sure that agencies that are funded by government that, and that is another bonus too, is like once the law changes, then uh, the government has to start to fund the agencies that it funds in a way that actually allows them to follow the law. So we can be, you know, again, campaigning for better funding for agencies, better funding for public services and leading by example, every chance we get. And if you have any one other pitch, maybe if any in the congregations uh, are small business owners and would like to become part of the Better Way Alliance, that would be really lovely as well. And I think Andrea uh, put the Better Way Alliance website in. Um, so that would be really great as well, because it builds people's confidence to know that there are other ways of doing business that can be successful. Any other questions or comments? Oops. I'm seeing the link is not working. I, one, one uh, I'll try to get a proper link going there. I'm not sure why. Sometimes the chat in Zoom doesn't always cooperate, but I'll get see if I can get a proper link in there. Yeah, great here. So yeah, if one great thing you can all do is sign up to get the email updates and that tells you when there's actions coming up, that tells you when organizing meetings are happening. It gives you a little bit of a you know political analysis to help us navigate 
what's happening. And, and you probably have all noticed there's been a real page in the, in the tone of the government lately where suddenly they've discovered workers and they've discovered that, I think Monty McNaughton, the labor minister said, it's like, we haven't always you know, been doing it right, or, but now we're gonna do it right. And so suddenly they're trying to do all the, so you know, protect workers. But I think it's Phil Donahue's uh, talk show used to say the best indicator of future of the future is, is what people have done in the past. So don't judge them on what they say they're gonna do, judge them on what they have done. And I think that the record is pretty clear around that as well. But it's gonna be tricky to make sure that we're reminding people of what has happened in the past and why we, we really do need to elect a new batch, I think. <laughs> Any other comments? I hope that this, I feel like I did an awful lot of talking. And so thank you for being so patient and lovely. Um, I, if anyone wants to add anything? Okay, well, Andrea, I'll pass it back over to you. I hope you're not still having to pass the, hold the space bar down. I think you're muted. I think you're muted. I wonder, here, try this. Oh, it worked just for a second. I think we're, I think we're at the end of our time allotment anyway, but I feel very honored to be here with all of you. And, and really the, the, I wanna say again, I should have said it more clearly at the beginning about how important faith leaders have been to our movement. And I just, yeah, I really, from the bottom of my heart, I really thank each and every one of you for everything you've been doing and it makes such a huge difference and I feel more optimistic today than ever that we can get this done. So thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>